Sloan, Here. Mrs. Johnson, Here. Mr. Bear, Here. Mr. Greenstein, Here. Mrs. Ndolny, Ms. Weisberg. Here. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make a motion for the adoption of the agenda January 5th, 2016. Do I have a second? Ms. Johnson, all in favor? 6 0. Oh, thank you. We'll now go to student and community comments, and we would just remind everyone to please identify themselves for the record, and that we still have a three-minute limit. No takers for the first meeting of the year. Okay. I would just like to say welcome back to everyone, and a happy new year. I hope everyone had a nice, restful break. And uh, as we move forward, I think everyone knows we start heading towards the budget season, and we have a lot of difficulties ahead of us as we have had for many years and a lot of decisions to be made and we hope everyone will help and participate in helping us to make those decisions. We will be discussing at the budget meeting on Monday when and if, but probably we, we think we should be having a community forum on the budget and the tax cap. So uh, we will make announcements that are pertinent after that. and. Uh, just proceed with the rest of the meeting. I'll turn it over to Dr. Mooney. Thank you. I also want to uh, thank everyone who braved the cold to come out tonight. Um, <laughs> that's a little shock to the system, but I guess we'll get used to it, or it's supposed to ease up a little bit, so that's a good thing. I also want to wish everyone a very happy new year and hope that everyone did enjoy the holiday break. Uh, I just have a few, um, just a couple of items just to sort of bring to uh, everyone's attention. Um, this is around the time of the year where we uh, start discussions and looking at the 2016-2017 uh, school calendar. Um, some of you may be aware that uh, many other districts actually have already adopted their calendars um, and there's always some question especially when the way Labor Day falls that sometimes we have to consider uh, starting school before Labor Day and this upcoming school year looks to be that type of calendar again um, but we are really working out all the details with all the, um, the constituents that we need to uh, consult with and we want to get that out um, very shortly and uh, some folks sometimes are concerned about like what the sports schedule might be like prior to Labor Day it's really the same as it usually is and it does, and those um, activities do usually start before Labor Day but if you have specific questions about that you can always contact um, Stephanie Joannin with any questions um, and just in case you're wondering why the parking lot seems so full and yet this auditorium seems so empty. Um, there's a very exciting boys basketball game going on right now in the gym, so uh, good luck to our, to our teams. Um, I also just, uh, more, just sort of want to bring to everyone's attention um, this year that uh, we are going to be having a district band spectacular as opposed to Night of a Thousand Strings. Um, but I'm very excited to say that that will also be held at the Tillis Center uh, as Night of a Thousand Strings was last year. The date of that is March 10th. Um, it's just an opportunity to really showcase uh, our different um, musical talents of our students. So we're kind of looking to rotate Night of a Thousand Strings with a district band spectacular, with something um, with the chorus. These events are co-sponsored with our creative arts department with Hearts and um, this year with the, uh, the Tillis Center for Arts Education Program. So we're really grateful to all of them for these opportunities. I think it's really a, a great experience for our students to be able to perform uh, in, a, in a 
center, such as the Tillis Center. Um, so it's free, so I hope everybody can come out for it and not to dwell on the weather, but hopefully the weather <laughs> will cooperate. Um, just throughout uh, prior to the holiday, there were quite a number of winter concerts. They were all um, really, really excellent. There's a couple of more uh, next week at some of the elementary schools. So again, kudos to our, to our students uh, for their hard work with that. And just finally, I did want to um, thank in all of our schools, there were quite a number of um, pre-holiday outreach activities. And again, it just demonstrates uh, how caring our community is and our students and our staff, um, so really want to thank everyone for that. Also, a special thanks to uh, Parent Council. They had a very successful winter coat drive um, this past fall, so, you know, it's just, just a wonderful community, and I know these uh, activities will continue. We always support one another, so I think we're off to a very, a very good uh, 2016. So. Um, enrollment will... We, we will talk about that under discussion, yes, thank you. I'll make a motion for approval of minutes for December 8th, 2015. Do I have a second, Mrs. Johnson? All in favor? Uh, five, abstain, one. That was Larry, he wasn't here before. And uh, now we'll move to our discussion item, the implications of increased enrollment. This is really more of an informal discussion tonight, uh, just to talk a little bit about um, what we are seeing and what's being experienced in our schools regarding uh, our increased enrollment and the impact and implications, of course, it's having on class size and programming. Um, it's sort of a, a pre-discussion as we do get into our budget uh, development discussion. We have had uh, a number, administrations had a number of discussions um, publicly just about enrollment. Our enrollment increases are, they're pretty well documented, so I'm not really looking tonight to um, go into in depth about what some of that is, but I do think it's always helpful to have a context um, for what we will be considering in the upcoming budget process. So just for a frame of reference, enrollment can tend to be a little bit of a moving target, so it's always better to look at more long-range numbers as opposed to on a more, you know, day-by-day -day situation. However, if we look at where our enrollment was um, at in December of 2014, last year, and where our last enrollment report put us, um, which was December 22nd of um, this past uh, 2015, we are increased in total by about 111, 112 students. Um, the breakout of that is primarily, interestingly enough, at Weber and Schreiber. Um, Weber is actually up at this point from December of last year to December of this year. They're up by 50 students. Uh, Schreiber is actually up by about 40 students. So at the secondary level, the increase is about 90 students. Uh, at the elementary level, though, there is a slight increase as well. It's about 21, 22 students. Um, we do know that our enrollment has increased. It seems to be the trend that we are moving toward, but our staffing overall has pretty much um, remained the same. So that is clearly something that we have to look at and consider um, as we're working through, as I said, our, you know, our budget process. Um, in years past, if we go back about five years from a staffing perspective, um, we had stayed pretty consistent from the 11-12 school year through the 13-14 school year. Very little movement in terms of staffing. Um, and enrollment has been increasing over those years. Uh, for 14-15, we did see a greater increase, believe it or not, in some of the staffing, even though it may not have 
have seemed that way. We did add some elementary sections and some other support staff, particularly in the ESL department and the special education departments to address the needs of those students. Um, so from, for 14, 15, and 15, 16 school year, the staffing um, levels have pretty much stayed the same, even though we did reduce some staffing at Schreiber um, over the last five years. Again, um, Schreiber has actually seen the greatest decrease in staffing overall. Um, they are now um, pretty close to, they've kind of fluctuated between being over 1,600 students to um, in the 1,590 range. Um, so that's where they are now. That's, that's very high. And Weber is clearly right now over 1,200 students. So that's a pretty significant um, population as well. We do know at the, our elementary schools, there are some schools where uh, the space is, is an issue. Um, for classes. I think at the secondary level, again, in previous uh, enrollment discussions, we know that we have seen uh, a greater increase of students um, who uh, speak a second language and are new to us, coming new to us, um, particularly at Schreiber. There have been changes in the Part 154 regulations for ESL. Um, that will also require us to give greater consideration to some other staffing needs. So it's kind of a general overview of where we are. I didn't know if uh, board members had any questions at this point about anything. Could you just explain the, what you just said the, about the, um, either the Part 54 or Part 154, 154 changes, what, what that means? I know that there are, there are, it's pretty complicated because there's on a number of levels there's changes, but there are uh, expectations for more like co-teaching type situations that have to occur. Um, perhaps Dr. Westervelt could elaborate a little more clearly. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as Dr. Mooney mentioned, there are requirements now under Part 154 of Commissioner of Regulations that we provide what called the integrated model, which um, <clears throat> is a co-teaching model that includes a, um, an ESL certified teacher and a content certified teacher. So it could be an ESL teacher with a math teacher or any of the other content areas. In addition, um, the um, NICETEL exam, which is the entry exam for students that determines whether or not they qualify for what is now called ENL instead of ESL, uh, is much more rigorous than the past exam. Therefore, more children are qualifying for ENL services. The exit exam, the NICISLAT, uh, has also become more rigorous. Therefore, it's uh, a little more difficult for students to exit the program. In addition to the integrated model, there are specified units of instruction that children who receive ENL services now have to have. So one part is the integrated model, the other part is what's called the standalone model. And so there are specified units based on the proficiency level um, of the child, of the English proficiency level of the child. Although you don't need to necessarily give a hard, fast number, do we have an idea about how many are actual new families moving in versus kids that are coming in under other mandates or um, situations? It's, it's kind of, I think it's a combination, really, of both. Um, we, do, we did see new families, particularly at the elementary school, um, just to the district where we saw, and not children necessarily coming to kindergarten, more in the upper grade levels, such as second, third, and fourth grade. Um, I, I would say at the secondary level, though, it did seem to be, at least our increases this year, seem to be more of students um, not speaking the language coming in. And then uh, the other question is that you were talking about staffing. As far as when a student is um, assigned 
a an aid that's an increase in staffing but not necessarily aiding many kids or many classrooms it's only aiding one do we see an increase in that type of scenario or is it more just an overall increase of staffing across the board um, when we look at our our teacher FTEs um, you know we have done some slight increases to that over the I would say the last two years but prior to that we had stayed um, pretty stagnant in terms of the our educational assistants and our teacher assistants if they are assigned by the committee on special education in general um, they're they're either assigned for an individual student a teacher assistant or there are some of the special education classes that require an aid as part of the ratio. However, uh, we have also assigned um, aids to our kindergarten classes, all have four-hour EAs. Um, some of our classes that have exceeded board policy, um, we have assigned teacher assistants and aides to various grade levels as a way of support. So. Um, you know, it is a number that does fluctuate. Uh, some years we see more um, recommendations, and other years we do we do see fewer recommendations. Um, I will say that with a recommendation from administration in the upcoming budget for class sections, if it is going to relieve some of the over class oversized class sections that have been assigned teacher assistants we would be recommending then not to continue with a teacher assistant uh, be for the class size issue yes so I don't know if that answers the question thanks it's um, a, an interesting dilemma that we have because we've been having growing class size for a long time uh, growing enrollment for a long time and in order to try to mitigate the increase in class size over the years, we've given up a lot of other things. We've given up JV3 uh, teams, we've given up a second musical, we've given up elementary clubs, we've given up computers in the middle school, we've, we've reduced PEP we, uh, in the elementary schools and in the middle school. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't come in a vacuum. And, and I guess the, the question is now we have more students who want to play sports, more students who want to join bands, more students who want to be in clubs, more students who want to do everything. And at the same time, we're keeping our staffing, um, we're, we're keeping our staffing flat. I guess what I'd like to see as we go forward is instead of um, taking, money, taking money from one pot and putting it into another and say, okay, we're going to eliminate all of this stuff so we can decrease class sizes, we're going to increase class sizes so we can keep all of this stuff, what would it cost to do what we actually want to do for our students? And let, let's, start with, let's start with that spot and, and let's, not, let's not negotiate against ourselves as we, as we, get, as, as we start the discussion and say we're go, things are going to be worse, the question is how much worse. I think that what we are administration is working on is not quite that extreme but certainly um, going from the premise that we would look to maintain what we already have and recommend additional staffing in specific areas to bring relief where we feel that it is needed as you said, none of this can be done in a vacuum, so we certainly have to see in the end what does that mean financially for the district and what ultimately can we afford, which does, in some sense, ask us to prioritize our, what our needs are. But we are starting this year um, looking at really what we feel we need and then prioritizing that going forward, being very, very aware of what the budget issues are related to it. It's just a reality for us. Um, it, the, the, the numbers, I, I, I think we've got to try to come up with a way to drill into what's happening to the numbers uh, more intently, uh, because there's a lot of things going on that sort of move outside of the norm. Uh, we have tremendous in-migration between kinder kindergarten and first grade. 
as kids come out of private kindergartens and come into the school district. And that happens year after year. But we, we can try to measure that. Um, Schreiber, just by graduating 377 and absorbing 410 from Weber, will go up automatically this year by a jump again, besides any in-migration that occurs. We're losing this year, year over year. We had decreases in population in 11th and 12th grade from their 10th and 11th grades, but tremendous increases in 9th and 10th grade through immigration. So we, we've got to get to some of the bottom of why that's going to happen. Weber goes down, theoretically, because 410 are moving up and 398 are coming out of elementary school. But the year before when that happened, we had 20 in-migration kids who moved in. So there's more going on than simply the normal classes just moving up. And we are also going to have to come, and this really gets to be sensitive, and I have no political slant here other than that I think as part of our fiduciary responsibility, we have to figure out if we are having overcrowding in certain houses within the community, outside of the laws of whether it's Nassau County, Port Washington Villages and everything else, because theoretically, we are collecting taxes based on assessed value of the number of single family, multi-family dwellings, whatever it is that forms the tax base. And if out of those homes you suddenly have, independent of anything we can manage, 10 kids or six kids or four kids of four different families, we are, we are faced with an ever-increasing enrollment without an ever-increasing fund base. And I don't know where that falls and how we manage this, but we cannot support to Larry's point that if you keep trying to stay within the tax cap and your enrollment keeps going up by 100 children, which in theory, we're, if, if you do the equation that we spend $27,000 per child and you get an extra 100, that's roughly $2.7 million that you should need of new money to support your school district. Well, that's more than the total tax cap is. So that would mean every other single line item has to be a zero, and then we have enough money to absorb those students actually on a, on a teacher basis or on just what we provide as a district. But we're nowhere close to that. So we keep economizing on all the edges, but sooner or later as just our role here, I think we've got to understand what's creating this impetus. And it's not simply turnover of generations of houses uh, that new families are moving in, because I think you see that with populations going in and out, that the gyrating numbers are above the turnover of real estate in Fort Washington. It's above the live birth rate that we get from Nassau County. So there are other external events that are creating a larger and larger pool of kids coming to our front door without a larger and larger pool of money. And it's, the economic reality for us as a school district, as a community, as the people in the buildings, uh, the requirement of being able to teach an increased caseload of ENL students suddenly at the secondary school where we had 40 kids show up and we simply don't have the staff to deal with it. We can't necessarily have proper guidance we don't necessarily have bilingual guidance counselors who suddenly can communicate with the families. It, there's just a, a never-ending cascading effect that as a district, we're gonna have to figure out what the future of this is. Because the, the kindergarten enrollment, interestingly enough, has started to go the other way. But the top side of the district is increasing well beyond what the bottom is starting to lose. We have one huge bubble moving up through the district, which is the 450-something third grade. And as that goes all the way up through the school district, we couple that with the in-migration that's occurring, we will strip out the capacity of Schreiber and Weber 
to cope with it. We, don't, we won't have the space to, to put all those kids in classrooms. And uh, unless we're at 35, 37, or whatever. And so I don't know from a legal standpoint where we're supposed to stand up and call upon the, the people who own these houses that are being rented out to comply with the law as far as who's using those facilities. We're not challenging, in a sense, whether you're citizen, not citizen, whoever that is. But I think there reaches a this economic imbalance for us overall as a as a school district that we can't cope with it, and so somewhere we have to push back. And I don't know that the answer is then suddenly that you're just going to arbitrarily exceed the tax cap, because that puts everything else at risk. Unless, as we jokingly have said, the tax cap is at zero, and then there's no loss, no foul there. Uh, but. Every time you have 1.5% or 1.7%, if that's what we're going to keep going with, it raises somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.7 to $2 million of fresh money. And that won't support 100 new kids with as much in-migration as we're seeing. And so somewhere we, we've got to dig into this and figure out exactly what that represents. And is it going to occur again in 1617? And if the trend is then again in 1819, you will overwhelm the school district's ability to cope with that mushroom because it's beyond simply kindergarten going up by 10 or 15 kids every year and going through the district. This is just from top to bottom, suddenly an explosion of children that if we, we can't manage. So I want to ask you, Alan, I mean, do you know beyond anecdotally that the living situation in certain places is, as you said, illegal versus people that have multifamily dwellings and are, you know, and are forced or, you know, or the best that they can do and what they are able to do is have three kids share a bedroom, for example. I'm just saying something that most of us wouldn't do, but if that's, that's the living situation, that's the living situation. I mean, it, there's different different needs in different communities in, in our greater community. And I mean, what, it's one thing to say that landlords are, or to suggest, if, I mean, or to have heard anecdotally, or if you've read it, I mean, I don't know, that landlords are, you know, just packing people into their houses, you know, and that in, a, in violation, if I would imagine, building codes, fire codes, you know, things like that, versus multi-family, dwellings where people have big families that if they had a big family like that you know in my neighborhood it'd be oh wow you know the Johnsons have five kids you know like whatever but here if the you know the Joneses in that community have and the and the other neighborhood if I have five kids but they only have two bedrooms like that's the way they could afford to live and, and go to our school it is not an, a, it's to a degree I don't have it in front of me but we have as a district information in our busing statistics that indicate multiple names inside the same address. And as such, we, I believe, and we haven't gone down this rabbit hole, so to speak, but I think that we could identify problem locations where, to your point, it's not just a family, the Jones is living in a part of town and having five children inside our school district, that it turns out that it's Jones and Smith and Barnes and this one and that one at the same location in exceeding what one would term as the norm of a multifamily dwelling. And that's why I say this is a bad subject from the word go because you are viewed as chasing after people who have struggled possibly to get here and all sorts of things, but ultimately, I feel like I sit here looking at 5,400 kids in education and that either we, we talk to landlords in a sense who, I don't think they're packing them in, but I believe that we may have a case where it's just being ignored. And, I, and that I don't know enough of. It goes beyond my understanding at that point. 
I just think there's more behind the numbers and we have more data that we could call through that would give us a, a more clear picture of what's actually going on and driving these numbers the way they are. I, I would suggest that we might want to speak to our council and find out exactly what rights we have to be asking any of these questions any further. And uh, going back to increased enrollment overall, I know that you were talking about recommendations from administrators, um, and I'm, I'm assuming this, but I wanted to ask you, if we're having these kinds of increases in enrollment, we talk frequently about class size, as in the main class size, but I would assume that we're now reaching the critical point where we have to be looking at specials and teachers and in place of the middle school and high school as well, but if we've really been cramming kids into those kinds of classes, and where it's a typical yeah. yeah. I mean, we do, we are looking at all of that, and you know, sometimes you see, um, like, point FTE of certain areas as well to bring some relief to where there are larger um, sizes. And you know, the space issue itself has not gone away for not only for the students, but for the staff as well. So um, you know, we clearly have some challenges and dilemmas before us. And I think we do try as best we can to look at the long-term picture. And we certainly do look at what's ahead in terms of what we currently know for enrollments and where those enrollments you know, will go. Your points are well taken. Um, but at the same time, the other challenge for us is you know, we do budgeting year by year. So it, the, kind of the what we try to do then, and I guess what I am trying to prepare the board for in terms of at least recommendations about regarding staffing related to enrollment, class size, and all the issues we've spoken about is that we are looking to sort of build more staffing, we may not be able to do it, you know, in one year, but it is certainly a reality that we have to consider. We did, you know, um, in previous years, there were, there were times when the enrollment did seem to um, decrease, and we could attrition, retirement positions, and things like that, um, but there is that ebb and flow, and we are clearly on the uptick, and therefore, um, the staffing really has to be uh, looked at more closely as well. So, unless anyone has anyone else, I assume that was sort of a uh, this discussion was sort of a heads up of where we're going. And um, Mary, by the next public meeting, will you have any idea of the number or the tax debt levy, or no? Well, we will be having a budget and facilities committee meeting uh, next Monday. I think you mentioned talking about a forum uh, regarding the tax cap. Uh, we do have an additional uh, budget meeting scheduled for the end of January. Um, is it the 25th, I believe? Uh, where we hopefully will have the levy limit. Uh, it will have been published by the state of New York at that point, and we will have had the opportunity to meet with the administrators. So we'll have a, a much tighter picture of staffing needs. And to Mr. Baer's point about the growing enrollment, I have said at budget meetings for the last umpteen years, <laughs> We average about 60 or 65 new students a year. That has been a very steady and consistent trend. Where this year, uh, it, it was a dramatic change. I think um, we need to see where um, the second year of that will take us, whether we, we will return down to our 60-something number. Um, but I think towards the end of January, we'll have a, a stronger number and, and then the opportunity for the board to consider recommendations. Um, Mary, I have a question. The um, life of pilots and stuff, I saw that there was some sort of s settlement between the town of Hempstead and Nassau County regarding the, the assessments of uh, bills going out late. Does that affect us at all? Does North Hempstead in the same situation? 
in terms of getting tax bills late because the, of the town's reassessments? The um, town of North Hempstead somehow dramatically was able to send out tax bills on time even though they told us only the day before the bills went out that they had lowered our overall assessments. So um, we did not have a quote unquote lawsuit for the bills going out late, but in fact, it is against the law for them to have adjusted the overall assessments after the board has submitted to the county the levy number by the legal date of August 15th. So um, many of the Nassau County districts have combined their legal forces, and with all due respect for any attorneys in the room, Sometimes when you have too many attorneys in the room, you can't get anything resolved. <laughs> so um, they're working on what our legal case will be, but uh, I think it has more to do with determining, at least in our situation, whether all of the assessments taken off our rolls are truly LIPA properties that were formerly owned by LILCO because they are the only ones who are supposed to be included in this pilot. Do we have an idea of how much we may be shorted uh, by this? $3.9 million. Just, just for us, just, just in Port Washington. So, so for even Nassau if we, County, it's $99 million. Okay, so even if we have a 2% tax cap, we wouldn't even get back the $3.9 million that's taken from us. Correct, but of course the county, for some reason, seems to think that even though they did not send LIPA a tax bill for the $3.9 million, they took those, do of those properties off the rolls, they do not have a written pilot agreement even established with LIPA. They can't even agree with LIPA that the total number of properties are accurate. LIPA seems to think there are more properties that should be included that are still on the tax rolls. But somehow it will all be resolved and we will all get our money by June 30th. Uh, can I suggest that we just send them a bill? Uh, just say this is how much taken off our property. Please send us a check for $4 million. Thank you very much. Apparently we don't have the legal authority to do that because the county is the, um, has the jurisdiction of determining assessed values and who is on a pilot and who is not. And we do not have any standing in even determining those pilot agreements. But we could just send them a letter asking them for money. We could. I, and I suggest we do. Thank you. Okay. But, but Mary, if, come July 1st, if we don't have the money, we could then file a suit against the county for short of the board. Um, I guess that's another question for the lawyers, whether it's the county that we would hold responsible for. Well, the, ca the, county, the county is saying, the county is saying, that the county guarantee, which is the, um, the area of the law that protected us about eight years ago when they took the Paul property off the rolls and we had to fight them for two or three years to get that money back, they're saying the county guarantee does not apply with a utility so that the county is not responsible for making us whole for any loss. So maybe that is a good reason why the attorneys can't all agree on which way to go to resolve this with the county. Mr. Baer, you have nothing to <laughs> add. <laughs> Mr. Baer is speechless. Larry and Mary are stuttering. Uh, can we then look into what happened with North Shore because they went through this to a big degree when the LIPA plan came offline and they had actually, I think it was like a $10 million hole on an annual basis in their budget. And then the state stepped in with a certain amount of money over, I think it was like a 10 or 15 year um, amortization of the loss of the funds that 
The specifics of the North Shore case, I can't tell you, I can find out for you, but certainly their attorney and the North Shore School District is very much involved in this, as are all the North Shore School Districts and uh, South Shore as well. So we have the benefit of, of that added counsel uh, to say how they pr moved forward to make things move at the state level. Uh, there are people who are trying to, oh, this is, I found this very interesting that um, th they were writing a joint letter from the attorneys on behalf of all the school districts in Nassau County. They were not writing to the governor. They were not writing to the senators or the assembly people. They were writing to the lobby person who would be able to then get in front of a senator or the governor or the controller. They hold all the power, apparently. And, and the other point is, in theory, if they change, if they pull that money off, if the, if the taxes actually have been correctly calculated, the 3.9 million should have been apportioned across the rest of the tax base if you were not going to actually give us the money. That should also be another avenue we can pursue that, that they acted unilaterally, if you will, outside the scope of the way the tax law actually takes into account. That once we pass the budget amount, they're obligated to that amount over the assessed pool. And if they change the assessed pool, they have to reallocate the 3.9 million. Right, but they, they didn't reallocate the full amount. They, the 3.9 came off, a portion of it did get reallocated into classes one, two, and four, which meant that all the other taxpayers did make up a portion of what was taken off for LIPA from the, um, from the category of tax class, but then 3.9 was taken off completely to be part of a pilot. Right, I mean, the, the belief is that LIPA will still pay it to the county under a pilot formula instead of having a sex property. That, the is, that is the theory, yes. And that, that money would then be forthcoming through the same uh, channels as other pilots that we have here in Port Washington. But, but failing that, we would have a claim against the county. But the county is saying no because the county guarantee, which does provide, well, that, that I yeah. Well, we would, we would have a claim, I think, still under the basis that they failed to reallocate the proper amount of taxes under the formula. That Let's imagine they get $2 million now from life, but the other $1.9 million should have been distributed across the 10,000 class one properties so that each one carries another, whatever it is, $190 in taxes, so we still got that $1.9 million. I know, but the interesting thing is it's post. It's not the 16, 17 budget. This is, this is theoretically a revenue shortfall for the 15, 16. What are we obligated to do? Walk through the draconian scenario that it never comes, and we collect 3.9 million less in revenue while our expenses are the same. Are we then obligated at that point to plug it from reserve just so we are zero at that point? The district, um, as we go through the budget cycle uh, this year, um, and as we watch the revenues come in, if our expenditures start to creep up to the point of being just, being shy of the, the mark of our shortfall in revenue, I need to come to the board and say, do you want me to cut something now? Or are we going to take money from our fund balance to plug the hole in our revenues? And, and then going forward, Going forward, I can't even um, 
I, I, our minus four million again if we thought the same scenario was going to take place in 1617. Except that we were told by the county that next year the same thing would happen, that they could not tell us what the value of the LIPO properties would be until after we submitted our levy requirement in August. It's totally untenable. It's totally unmanageable. There's no way a school business official can post the required tax levy limit on the March 1st deadline by the controller. That's why we're all just scratching our heads and leaving all the attorneys in the room together because no one ever consulted schools about this LIPA Reform Act of 2013, which caused this problem passed by the legislators. But back to the cluster <laughs> plan. Yes. If we get to May, and this hasn't been resolved, we will arrive at calculating a budget that is $4 million short on the revenue side. How are we going to propose at that point if there's no if there's no, been no resolution before the June 3rd date when they told you when you get money, which would at least give us some guidance as to the impact in the subsequent year's budget. There, the, the calculation we're forced to make at that point is that instead of 144 million, we will only start with 140 million. Therefore, our expenses at that point should only be 140 million. If, if we walk that through this theoretical budget process. At this point, um, and the business officials have met to discuss this in great length, at this point, we are all approaching our budgets as if this has not happened. Because it's the only way we can look at budgets and revenue, expenditures and revenues is in the original form until we get some legal advice that says that we can't go that way. Obviously, I, I wouldn't use the word, I, I'm using two sets of formulas, one with the revised number, but I'm not talking to you folks about that yet, <laughs> and using the current formula, because I have to compare uh, what I believe I submitted to the controller's office and to the county is the higher levy. And I will prepare next year's budget to compare it to what this board and this community authorized. But I do have the numbers relative to the reduction, but we're also being told by the assessor's office that they can't even give us numbers for what the pilot would be for next year. There's no way of knowing because then it sounded as if they weren't even truly assessing it accurately by school district. I think initially they were just trying to break up percentages until people actually started asking them questions. They thought we would just accept it in a conference call with 40 school districts on the phone and the county assessor's office. They gave us a, a three minute spiel about the uh, LIPA Reform Act of 2013 and what they had done with our tax bills miraculously overnight. And did anybody have any questions? That was really it. And there, there were only about four or five people who spoke up, but you could see by the telephone conference call that there were about 55 people on the line. People didn't even know enough about what questions to ask. The only reason I knew was because we fought with the county once before, and I brought that up on the phone. And all of a sudden now they're saying, because at first they said, oh yes, the county guarantee will be in effect. 
now in subsequent meetings with the attorneys, the county guarantee will not be in effect because this is a utility. Right, this is $99 million that the county has taken off the tax rolls in favor of LIPA. Isn't this something that the legislative task force should be doing? Really? Isn't this something, I mean, this is urgent. No, but if they put out what they thought community members could say to their legislators and everyone else, I mean, this is, this is urgent. They need to go to the top of the list. Yeah, we need to post something on our website. This is what we've said. Please feel free to copy it and call these people and send your own. Okay. Um, committee reports. Did anybody do policy meetings in the last meeting? Okay. Well, I have a good report. <laughs> Our last meeting was December 18th, and uh, actually the minutes are going to be posted in the next couple of days on the website so you can read about it in more detail. But overall, the general topic of our last meeting was um, a presentation by Mr. Maloney on the suggested upgrades that we can make to our website to make it more user-friendly, to make it more accessible, um, to in, in improve our updating of content and um, just and utilize it to a greater extent the way we would all like to. Um, our next meeting is on January 29th. That'll be at the Daily Annex Conference Room at 8.30. And the topic will be one of our favorites. It's on returning the tests and the tutoring policy in the district. So um, I invite everybody to attend. I'm not sure who, are, who will be presenting, but we will have some administrators there, of course. Thank you. Uh, we spent the month of December to a great deal looking at the different types of fill. Uh, there are something in the order of 14 or 15 different types. The one that we heard in the last one was something called green clay, which was an organic infill Next board meeting, we will cover the topic in greater detail uh, to talk about uh, what the infill material on the proposed turf field should be composed of. Um, the budget, of course, we just heard the good news there. And uh, the next meeting is Monday the 11th at 8.15 in Bailey, and then followed by the meeting on the 25th. Um, we have not met since the last meeting, and our meeting is on Friday the 22nd, and uh, do we have a topic yet? Oh, the directors are presenting their curriculum uh, updates. So uh, that will be at daily also at uh, 8, 8 o'clock, 8.30. I'll be there at 8. Um, now go to the action items and move items A1 through B9 or the second. Mrs. Johnson, all in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Um, just ask everyone to take note of the change to the board's curriculum committee as Mr. Hohauser has resigned from the board. Chris Nadoni will be stepping in as the third member of the curriculum committee. And now, is there any old business? Back from um, ah, the donor, the legislator who's giving us the money for the two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Will we hear any more on that? I thought it, we were at one twenty-five. Oh, okay, um, <laughs> I'm going for more money now. I know. We got some more parking spots. But we're up to nine parking spots. Nine out of ten. We'll wait until this new enforcement thing comes with the camera. We'll, we'll have them lined up. So. I think um, a letter was written to uh, Michelle Schimmel indicating our interest and in what it was. 
And um, I think the next step, they, they, uh, they have to send us some forms to be completed. But I think that that can take a very long time, actually. Very long. New business? Okay, we have another opportunity for any community members to be heard that would like to this evening. Happy New Year. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Happy New Year, everybody. Dave Sattinger. Um, first, I would second Larry's idea of sending them a bill. Maybe you call it a pilot. Bill in lieu of pilot. Have all the districts send one out. I think it would be a, a great way to make a statement. Um, the next thing I want to say is I, I really want to be careful and encourage us again to really not look at exceeding the tax cap because I think Albany has shown consistently over time that they're going to look to take away funding each and every way you can um, because they can't make their budget either and whatever we wind up exceeding the tax cap and getting they will probably come back and take away from us and send to some of the poorer upstate districts where the Republicans have a stronghold in the inner cities where the Democrats rule the roost. So um, it's a very challenging situation and I think we have to figure it out. Finally, um, I, a couple of things. I think we have to be really careful about the housing issue that we're talking about um, for some of the reasons that I just talked about politically statewide. I don't think we want to get that reputation, especially since we're dependent upon so much funding from Albany. We have to be really, really careful and sensitive with that. And then um, when it comes to what we're going to do, um, I've said it before, um, diversity is a strength of our district. I want to encourage us again to move towards a bilingual program um, with foreign language starting in elementary schools because I think over time, what we're seeing with the expanding populations in Weber and Schreiber, I don't think it's an anomaly. I think at times you're going to see kids in this district moving to get a degree from Schreiber High School, starting at Weber. And I think to the extent that we have a student population of over a thousand kids, where many of them are bilingual, that will help our, our school situation tremendously over time, um, not only with, um, um, the education, but just in terms of the safety and, and, and school atmosphere as well. So I don't know what that is. That's going to require a lot of cooperation um, with the teachers, um, but we're going to have to fun fundamentally plan for that over time because I don't think it's an issue that's going away anytime soon. So the longer range approach we take in building in our hiring practices to move towards that direction should start probably now. Thanks. Any further community comments? Okay, then uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.